will now begin our first session on assessing the impact of a global financial crisis on growth potential. The moderator for this session is Dr. Narayana Kochalakora, who serves as president at the Federal Reserve Bank Minneapolis. Please welcome President Kochalakora. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the um, Bank of Korea for organizing such a uh, tremendous conference. Uh, we already learned a lot from our uh, keynote speakers, and uh, I, 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 know, I know that we're going to learn a lot from the next session as well. Um, I won't go through it, uh, uh, lengthy bi biographies for our, our speakers. Those biographies are available to you in your, your, your book. Um, our first speaker is uh, Professor Ricardo Caballero from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he's going to be talking about the safety trap. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a very important uh, piece of work that he's uh, been doing with Emmanuel Farhi on understanding the, the, the importance of demand and supply of safe assets and the, the implications for, for policy of all kinds. So please welcome uh, Ricardo Caballero. Thank you, Narayana, for, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the Bank of Korea for having me here. And, uh, I intend to continue with some of the topics that that uh, we saw this morning in the in the keynote speeches. I was a bit worried about this topic uh, since it didn't sort of match the heading of the, this particular session, growth and something something. But fortunately, Larry Summers came along in between and and, and related these topics to secular stagnation. So I think I, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so I want to do. Uh, three things today. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, I want to talk a little bit about what, what do I mean by, by safe assets and, uh, and where do I think this comes, these things come from. I then want to spend some time uh, sketching them all. I have no time to present them all. And that's the paper essentially with Emmanuel Fari that you have in your folders. Uh, and then I want to end with some conjectures which probably can lead to discussion uh, at the end of the session. And uh, as Narayana mentioned, much of this work is joint work with Emmanuel Fari, also with Pierre Olivier Bouninsha, uh, Ab Simsek, and many other uh, prominent uh, young economists, younger than me at least. So uh, what is a safe asset? I, I don't really know, and nobody really knows what a safe asset is, and it means different things to different people. Uh, but it has become fashionable to talk about safe assets, and even there are some surveys about what safe assets may be. So here you have one example, uh, and this is a survey of uh, portfolio managers, institutional portfolio managers, and the question is very simple. What do you think is a safe asset? Uh, a great majority of them answers, well, quality sovereign debt. There is very little doubt that quality sovereign debt there may be doubt about quality means and who belongs to quality, but that quality sovereign debt is, uh, is a safe asset. Then inflation-linked bonds, well, that clearly depends on what you're worried about. If you're worried about inflation, then that sounds a lot safer than any sovereign debt. And I assume that when people talk about precious metals, there are also people that are very worried about inflationary spikes and things of that kind. Quality real estate market, uh, quality credit, uh, um, and many say there is no such a thing as as a safe asset. So uh, uh, there is obviously a large number of possibilities. I think, at, especially at the micro level, it depends a, a, a lot on what your portfolio is, on what do you do in your life, and things like that. What is safe? What is not safe? And 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 so on. But I want to propose a specific, uh, uh, a more specific uh, definition. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's the working definition I use in, 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 in what I'll say today and what we have used throughout uh, m most of our work. And for us, an asset would, uh, is safe or safer if it preserves a significant share of its value if macroeconomic conditions worsen and worsen in a significant way. So perhaps along of the of the things that Robert talked about in this morning, is an asset that you know, preserves its value, most of its value, if we go into one of these rare events, for example. Okay? Now, what is a rare event that matters to you also varies over time. If you're worried about inflation and that's the main risk, then, then that's your macroeconomic event. In recent times, the main macroeconomic events we're worried about are mostly very growth, severe growth type events, which may come from financial disasters or other things, but it's mostly about growth. It's much less so about inflation. So what I have in mind today when I talk about a safe asset, a safe macro asset, is an asset that is sort of fairly resilient to 
uh, uh, dramatic worsening, worsening macroeconomic conditions define as essentially growth. What is the origin of this shortage? I, I don't really know, but I'm going to tell a story that, that I think is, is, uh, captures a part of, of, of what has happened. I think the world was described uh, you know, 20 years ago very much by a picture like this, a picture where, where you had a sort of fairly stable core where most developed economies belong, and then an unstable periphery. You know? you, I'm a Latin American, I'm Chilean, and we were used sort of to, 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 to have certain, certain uh, uh, bad macroeconomic ep episodes often related to financial crisis. And, and, and over time, you know, some, some, some countries, my country, Chile, sort of implemented certain reforms that make them belong a little bit more to the core, uh, get closer to the core, but that was life out there in the periphery. It was sort of unstable and a core that was very stable. When Latin Americans were involved in this crisis, we didn't do much about it, just waited for the next one to come and so on. But when the Asian economies got involved into big crises in the end of the 90s, then they did decide to do something about it. And in particular, they decided to take many prudential measures. And most of the prudential measures, aside from macroeconomic reforms, fiscal reforms, and so on, involve substantial accumulation of safe assets uh, in the central banks, sovereign wealth funds, and, and institutions of that kind. Okay? So, so much of what happens post-90s uh, a substantial part of what happens in international capital markets post 90s had to do with, with uh, the periphery of the world sort of building fences against the next financial crisis by buying sort of very safe assets uh, from the core. In my view, uh, you know, there, there are many arguments for what happened behind the subprime crisis, many, many relevant arguments, there are political issues, there are incentive issues. But to me, the main macroeconomic force behind this, this crisis was precisely that, an enormous demand for safe assets from the rest of the world. Uh, the U.S. happened to be at the time in which uh, it was, uh, fiscal deficits were contracting, so there wasn't much issuance of safe debt. Corporates have a very hard time at producing there are very few corporates that can really produce very, very safe assets. So the next, the next layer was sort of, you know, finding risky assets and somehow by financial engineering transform them into at least produce a tranche of safe assets. Well, that's complicated. You know, you, you, to generate a, to generate a NASDAQ type, type, type boom, you just need a, a hippie with a mother that is willing to lend the garage to the guy and that's enough to create an asset. If you want to create Safe assets, you no, know, uh, uh, from risky assets, that, that cannot be done in a garage. It needs to involve the financial system, and I think that was very important in the process of infecting the U.S. financial system. I'm not blaming the rest of the world on the financial crisis, but I'm saying that was a, a global uh, context in which the financial crisis happened. So massive accumulation of reserves, sovereign wealth assets, and so on. Now, during the crisis, so that's a structural force, and I think that structural force is re-emerging. We're beginning to see it now as we as we, as the, as the critic, uh, critical phase is, is behind us. But the, the crisis itself certainly worsened the, short, the shortage massively from both sides. First, all the uncertainty that arose at the time generated an enormous demand for safe assets, but also, more importantly, an important part of the industry that has been created, the private industry that has been created to produce these safe assets, vanished essentially. Okay, so big contraction in the supplies of these assets, Naturally, in a crisis, big increase in demand for safe assets, some of the things that Robert talked about in the morning. Now, we learned good things about also the world at the time. We learned that the, the periphery actually was a lot more stable than it used to be. And precisely because I've done all this, this, this house cleaning and this uh, precautionary and taking all these precautionary measures in the previous phase. But there's no way, simply no way of replacing the importance of domestic, of, of big developed mark, financial markets for those of the periphery in terms of production of, of, of assets. Uh, uh, just the sizes don't fit. And if you look at the particulars of very safe assets, then the comparative advantage of developed economies is just three orders of magnitude larger than that of emerging markets. So there was no way of repla replacing what was being missed at the core for what was newly discovered at the, on the periphery, even though uh, uh, some of the assets in the periphery actually began to show up in the balance sheets of central banks around the world. Uh, many people have tried to document the size of the, of the, of the contraction in, 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 in safe assets, and since we don't sort of fully agree on what safe assets are, it's difficult to come up with something. But Barclays try, and here you have, and in that table, the table essentially argues that, that, that the, the supply of what is 
commonly perceived as safe assets or the most easily identifiable safe assets, essentially contracted by half during the financial crisis. Certainly the production of private sector uh, uh, financial assets uh, contracted, the, the, the assets behind the GSE is also contracted, Italy and Spain, uh, Spanish public debt, and there is a lot of that, uh, certainly uh, uh, con uh, this, uh, did no longer belong to, at least for, a, for some period of time, to the, to the perceived supply of, of size assets. So big contraction on the supply side. So that's the world that Emmanuel and I try to understand. What happens with a scenario where you have this both structural problems and also very acute phase, or a very acute phase of shortage of assets. And, what I'm, and the model that you have it, uh, in, in your folders now is about that. It's about the very acute phase of uh, uh, safe asset shortages. So no time to, to – how much time do I have? I lost track. You lost track as well. Okay, so I'm fine. So uh, – uh, no time to, to, to develop the mall, but let me just sketch uh, the mall. And, and, and there's, by sketching the mall, I, I mean essentially telling you about three blocks of the mall. Uh, so what do we need? We need a mall in which people want to store value. We need a mall in which uh, uh, there is a difference between safe and at least some agents perceive a difference between some assets and others. Some of them are safe, some of them are not. And then we need some part of the supply side of safe assets. You know, certain, certain days the economy has an ability to produce certain amount of safe, safe assets. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to describe, these three blocks, and then what happens when these blocks sort of, uh, when certain parts of the blocks are not well aligned. So to have a model in which you want the store of value, uh, uh, OLG, an OLG is a very simple structure to have. And what we have there is an OLG, a perpetual youth type model in which, you know, a fraction theta of people die every period and a fraction theta are born but there is no sense of life cycle. We want them to store a lot of value, so these people don't consume at all during their life, and the last second before they die, they consume everything. So that's maximum a, a store of value. That's what we want them to have. Okay? So there we have this theta uh, that, that is the only reason you consume is because you are told you have only one day left and you use it, and, and that's what you do. Um, agents earn income at birth, and again, consumer debt, so they need to carry these this, this savings through time. Now, output, I'm going to call it output for now, is really potential output. It's going to be just endowment here, an endowment X, unless something extreme happens. And there are two extreme hap things that can happen. I'm going to talk only about the second uh, extreme that can happen, which is something that Robert talked about already this morning. There is a possibility that, that there is a hazard that something very bad happens. That means that this permanent endowment economy may go from X to mu minus X, which is a lot less than X, okay? And that happens with some intensity lambda uh, minus, which I'm going to send to zero just because the equations look a lot smaller. It's positive, but, but, but the, the equation looks a lot simpler if I send them to zero. The counterpart of that is I have to make people very risk averse so they worry about something that even now has a, a, a very small probability of, of happening. Now, all the interesting part of the model here doesn't happen when it doesn't happen when, when the problem happens. It happens before the problem happens, before we go into the crisis. That's what we're trying to talk about, the precautionary measures that people undertake because there's a fear that the, of this rare event happening out there. So in the pre-Poisson event phase, the part that we're interested, you can think of these assets as producing two things, a deviant, delta X, but it's a deviant that is risky because, you know, things can go wrong with that deviant, and then some labor income, which is what fits the... the the, the, the newborn, okay? So now, now the rest of the more is about what happens to this income. Can we change it into something safe or not safe? Is there a demand for something safe or not safe of that income? At this point, it's just something that is, 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 is risky because there's a possibility that something really wrong happens to it. So there's two market clearing conditions at this point in this pre-Poisson phase. The post-Poisson phase looks the same with a mu minus in front of X. Uh, so there's a good market condition clearing. You know, uh, so remember, WT is going to be the wealth of the consumers, the households, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, theta is the fraction of them that, that have one day to live. So those, that's, those are the guys that consume. So theta times W is consumption. X, X is output. You have consumption equal to output. From there, I know what the value of wealth in the portfolio of individuals is because it's, I just need to divide theta both sides. And I have a very simple model in which I know exactly what the wealth is at each point in time, x over theta. 
And then I have an asset market clearing condition, which is the value of the assets in that economy, V, has to be equal to the wealth the, the household has. And therefore, I have a very simple model in which I know exactly what the wealth of that economy is at any point in time, the value of the assets in that economy is at any point in time. The value V of all the assets in that economy at that point is simply X over theta. Okay? Very simple. And now I want to split that value into safe and, 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 and risky assets. So that's the last part of the model, uh, so bear with me. So, oh, it's two slides more. Uh, so I need a demand for safe and non-safe, and for that I have, you know, the fraction alpha of the population are going to be what we call nightians, very risk-averse people, minimax, minimax max people, people that are not going to want to hold any risky stuff, and then a fraction Y minus alpha will be neutrals, risk neutral individuals that are indifferent between risky and riskless as long as expected return is the same. I can split the wealth held at any point in time, W, into the part that is held by the nightians, WK, and that is held by the non night and the neutrals, N. And now I need to look at the supply side, and I'm done. So I, I was one slide ahead of what I told you. I, I need to look at the supply of safe assets, which are the things that the nightians are going to like, and then the supply of the rest. So the, the, this endowment economy is essentially has one tree, a la Lucas, you know, and that tree produces labor income, uh, which goes to the newborn, and produces this dividend delta, delta X. Now, the quality of the financial system of that, this economy, which is not something I'm going to talk very much about that here, is what we capture with this parameter rho, which is the ability of the system to tranche that dividend into a safe and a risky asset. So when your financial system is in trouble, it's very difficult to unscramble risky with riskless assets. But I'm going to take that as even now. So a fraction of that delta X, which is the dividend, and the present value of that, that's what makes it an asset, can be tranched into a safe tranche and a risky tranche. You know, that's what banks were trying to do, uh, 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 CDOs and things like that, were trying to do. Maybe they put the threshold at the wrong place. In this paper, at least, they're going to put the threshold at the right place. Okay? So... So again, I can split the, the supply of assets in this economy, V, into what is the safe supply, the part that is tranche, that is safe, and the risky part, which is a residual from that uh, tranche part. And I know exactly what the supply of, of, of safe assets is at any point in time, because I define a safe asset as one that does not change in value if we get into this terrible crisis. But I know exactly how much the asset will be worth if we go into a terrible crisis. It's going to be mu minus times x over theta. And of course, since I only can tranche rho, I have this rho in front. But that's the value of the safe assets even before the crisis, because that's the, that's the definition. It's something that doesn't change in value if we go into the crisis. And since I know what the value of total assets is, x over theta, then I know also how much the value of risky assets. So I have a model, and I can talk about supply, demand of, of safe assets, and, and it's very simple. So what happens in these models, I'm not going to go through the whole model, obviously, uh, is, is that neutrals will be different, will hold safe or, or, and risky assets. Knightians will only hold safe assets. So we know that the, at any point in time, the wealth of the Knightian has to be less or equal than the availability of, of the, the value of the safe assets in the economy. And the, and the price of this, or the inverse of the price, which is the return, the exempt returns of these assets, means that the safe interest rate, which I'm going to call RK, the, the Knightian's uh, uh, rate, is always less or equal than whatever is the risky rate, okay? So two regimes, I care only about the second regime, and they, then equations stop. One regime, there is enough safe assets relative to the amount of Knightian's, so, so the neutrals are the marginal investors, these two rates are the same. There is a constrained regime when there is a lot of nightens related to the ability of that financial system to produce safe assets, and therefore you are in a constrained regime in which there is a spread. The, the nightend rate is very, very low. Okay? The problem is very severe. The shortage is very severe. This nightend rate, this very safe rate, is, is very, very low. What is the safety trap? So up to now, the, we have an endowment economy that, that, that produces output. All that we have is an asset pricing model. It's, an, it's a Lucas-type model in which we price differently risky and riskless assets. So what is the safety trap? Well, the safety trap means something very similar to the liquidity trap. As the, as the shortage of the safe assets starts worsening, then the riskless rate has to drop more and more and more. If at some point there's a limit of how much that can drop, zero is a natural place, at least for the nominal uh, uh, equivalent of that rate, 
uh, because then money becomes a safe asset, no? And reserves of the central bank become uh, the safe asset. It's not used for transaction, but used for a store of value. Then, then there's a limit to how much that, that rate can fall. And beyond that, you have a problem, no? And you have a problem we develop from this equilibrium model, Barrow Grossman type stuff, very confusing things. So then we decide to change it for something with more equations, but, but, but more modern, uh, clumsier, I would say, but, but you know, neo Keynesian with, with a cash in advance constraint and all sorts of things. I, I don't particularly care about any particular story, but the point is at some point it becomes difficult for this rate to fall, and then you have to find some other mechanism to lower the demand for safe assets, and the only, uh, only other mechanism you have is to lower the income. So poor pensioners suffer a lot in this environment as well, that's part of the equilibrium adjustment. You need those that demand safe assets to start any lower and lower return. If at some point the, lower, the returns cannot be lower anymore, then it has to come through some other mechanism. The other mechanism in this model is through a reduction in output, okay? So everybody becomes poorer, then the demands for safe assets drops and so on. And that's, that's what it is, and that's what we call the, the safety trap. That's a simple diagram that illustrates what happens. There's a supply of safe assets, that's the mu there, uh, and, and the band of, of safe assets is that, that line there. It looks upward sloping because, because it's in the space of interest rather than prices, so that's a, the demand of safe assets. Uh, and, and what happens here is that if there's, for any reason, a contraction in the supply of safe assets, then the natural mechanism of adjustment is for a reduction in the in the Nikean rate, in the riskless rate, if that cannot drop, then something else has to happen. Something else that happens here is the income of the newborn here starts to drop until you get an equilibrium around here with, with a lower level of activity. So then this, this market starts pinning down the equilibrium level of output rather than uh, the equilibrium level of, of, of rates, okay? Now, it happens that, now let me move to policy, so that's our world. Next, we move to policy. Well, it happens that that uh, if you introduce a, 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 a short-term uh, public debt, uh, we make it short-term here because long-term debt leads to other issues and we can talk about operation twist in the discussion section if you want. I sort of share a bit the view that Robert had, but let me skip that for now. But uh, so, so what happens here is, well, the concept of fiscal capacity that is relevant in a world in which the problem is a shortage of six assets is not how much taxes you can price on average, but it's how much you can collect in that terrible event. So if the bad crisis happens, how much can you really co correct there? If you, if, you, if you can collect taxes in other states of the world but not in that one, you may be able to produce risky debt, but you're not going to be able to produce safe debt, okay? So the definition of safe debt here, safe, safe public debt, is, is that one which is supported by tax revenues in the bad state of the world, okay? So once you operate this way, you end up with this parameter tau minus, which is the ability to collect raised taxes in the bad state of the world, uh, which is isomorphic to our index of private financial development raw. Okay, and you can treat it exactly like that in the model, and therefore there is a substitutability between tau minus and raw. So if you have a problem in the, public, in the private sector, some problem in your financial sector, you can substitute that for public debt if your, your sovereign is sufficiently uh, uh, sound in the case of, of, the, of the rare event, okay? So the concept of fiscal capacity becomes crucial here, and the same applies to helicopter drops and things of that kind, which we do discuss here. So from the point of view of macroeconomic policy, when you think about this uh, in these terms, the policies that work are policies that either support U minus, I mean, if the crisis happens, somehow the crisis looks a little better, or that increase the share of safe assets in the economy. Those are the things that work. So put policies backed by fiscal capacity, so whatever it takes type of speeches, if they really you have whatever it takes, then that definitely works. QE1, that is buying, uh, what happens in a, in a situation like this is the private sector has too many risky assets, the, private, the public sector has, too, has most of the capacity to produce uh, safe assets, and you need to swap those. A swap of that kind may induce credit risk, put transfer credit risk to the balance sheet of the, of the, of the, of the Fed, and you may not like that, but it's very effective uh, from the point of view of this particular problem. Okay? So that works. What are the policies that do not work that, that, that we typically discuss about? Well, policies that support the good state of the world, new plus, no? Because that's not the problem. That's not the bottleneck in the economy. So in the standard liquidity, if you think about the Woodford type 
forward guidance that's really about supporting the good state of the world. It says, look, I can't give you more now in the bad state of the world or in the intermediate state of the world, but when things recover, I will be able to give you more stuff, and I'll give you more stuff for a little while. And through the wealth effect of that, you can sort of boost consumption today. That's the Krugman and all, all the rest. Well, that doesn't work in the case of a safety trap because your problem is not, you're not even thinking about mu plus, you're thinking about mu minus, and that's, what, that's the, real, the real constraint. Okay? So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important difference. Uh, now, a remark, since I have so many prominent central bankers in this room here, uh, this is not a comment on the current policy of the U.S. in particular, no? I, I happen to believe that, and there we disagree in the extent with, with my co-authors, but that the relative importance of this mechanism varies over the process. I mean, I think when you're in the middle of the crisis, this stuff is far more binding than the standard liquidity trap. I think you're evolved into a liquidity trap when you have uh, uh, gone so, so deep. Okay, so that's, that's something that varies in intensity. Having said that, I, I do believe that this, is, this does not mean, or what I just said does not mean that I think we should just ignore this problem because it's behind us, at least in the U.S., who knows in other places of the world. I think this will remain as a secular problem. It was a secular problem. It got incredibly exacerbated during the crisis, but I think it's, it's, it may well be coming back. Uh, uh, so I call this Greenspan conundrum too. Remember that that when Greenspan was trying to raise interest rates in the mid-2000s, there was this conundrum that the long rates were declining at the same time. So it was trying to jack up the short rates, but the long rates were declining. And many of us made the point that, well, maybe because there were two different forces. One that had to do with this enormous demand for safe assets, which was pulling the long rates down. And, and on the other hand, you had you know, the monetary policy effect, which controlled the front end of the, of the term structure. Now, uh, maybe you should call it Yellen one then, but, but, but uh, what I have here is essentially the, the long race, five years into five years in the U.S., and I have the famous or infamous dots of the, depends on which side of the market you are, of the, of the Fed, no? and you see that the long rates are now really even going below, soon, next week, below even the, the, the most conservative dots of, of, the, of, our, of, of our governors. I think that, so you see what you see in the U.S. today, it was attributed to the bad weather and all these kind of things. But even now, when you get good surprises in the U.S. in recent weeks, you still see the long rates in the U.S. declining. It all goes to effects. Nothing is happening to rates. In my view, this may have something to do with the fact that we still have a secular trend towards uh, having very low uh, uh, rates on, 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 on very safe assets. So to conclude, you know, yes, I, I do think that today, it's mostly a latent problem. It's not really uh, the dominant problem in the, in, it's not in the front lines, at least in the U.S. Uh, and I think that this safety trap is just too close for, co for comfort in the sense that, you know, even minor events like this recession, recent recession can put you into it very, very, very quickly. Now, that also has, has problems from the point of view of what kind of policy framework we develop for the next time we get into a situation like that. But it also has implications for the transition before we get into those things, because the incentive for the private sector actually to produce these safe assets are enormous. I think that's the way we got into trouble, and I find it highly unlikely that we're not going to see enormous pressures again to create something like that. In fact, even central banks around the world miss some of the markets that created the problem. Europe now is trying to boost the ABS market and so on because we don't have a channel of intervention there. So, 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 so I, 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 we need to keep the eyes open, not me, but those of you that are involved in these kind of things for, for, for the next uh, uh, source of fragility. I think it also has incentives on the, for the supply side of the con economy, corporate incentives change when, when there's so much value in producing the safe, as safe assets. I mean, you can think of hoarding cash as a way of transforming your assets into safer assets, for example. No? So rather than investing in risky investment, which produces a risky asset, you may hold cash, combine it with the amount of risk investment you have, and that as a whole looks a lot safer. And it is a premium on the production of safe assets that allows you to issue debt at very low prices and therefore and then buy your equity back. So all these kind of things to me are symptoms of, of, of an enormous premium for producing sort of very, very, very safe assets. It also has cross-sectional implications. I think that what is happening between emerging markets and, 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 and the periphery of Europe is, is quite interesting. I think that, you know, we had all these, these speeches on, on, on uh, currency wars and things of that kind, and they were associated to enormous expansion, particularly of the Fed at the time. But I think there was another phenomenon going on that was very important for emerging markets, which is that the periphery of Europe looked terrible. 
and the peripheral look, look, Europe looked terrible. There were some emerging markets that looked a lot better because, you know, had been very stable because they had taken all these prudential measures, and there was an enormous relocation of, 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 of international funds towards emerging markets. I understand that. Let me use my last zero minute, uh, my zero minutes efficiently. So there was an enormous incentive to, to relocate funds towards the peripheral economy, and, and again, Many central banks around the world now do have Chilean uh, bonds and, and, and uh, exotic products in their balance sheet, which I think have a lot to do with that. Conversely now, there's an enormous boom in the periphery of Europe of assets. The expresses have compressed to unreasonable levels in, from my point of view, given the economic fundamentals. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that the emerging markets don't look that, that great on these days. And that has also led to a reversal of flows, many of those coming from this region, by the way. Okay, so, so, so that's, uh, that's also to me a symptom that, that, that there is, you know, in the mall there is safe and unsafe. In reality, there's a continuum of assets. And, and there are certain economies that live precisely in between the, in that marginal region. That's emerging markets, some emerging markets, the best of emerging markets. And, 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 and I won't say the worst, and the periphery of Europe. And, and then those countries are, are exposed to a volatility which is, which is recent. It's a recent phenomenon, I think, is related to these kind of things. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, David Turner of the OECD. Uh, I think all policymakers are all, all were very aware from an early stage about the, the, the impact that the financial crisis was having on, on aggregate demand. Uh, but I think it's become increasingly clear that it's also had a, a non-trivial impact on, on the supply side of the economy. And uh, David's paper is going to be about the, quantifying that, that impact. Oh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, the title of the conference is Strengthening Growth in the Aftermath of the Crisis. My uh, paper is uh, attempting to uh, address the, the, the size of the damage to potential growth from the crisis. Um, it's assessing that damage in a, in a very particular way, and it's, clear to, it's important to get that clear right from the start. It's the loss in medium-term output relative to what we might have expected in the absence of the crisis. So straight away, we have to compare it to a counterfactual world. And uh, one of the points uh, that is made in the paper uh, at a great deal more length is the danger of, of trying to establish uh, that counterfactual uh, um, by using actual GDP growth. Because there's a great danger uh, by using actual GDP numbers that you end up with an inflated growth path and therefore exaggerate um, the crisis losses. So I've got an example in this slide. What you're looking at is the, the blue solid line is aggregate OECD GDP. Uh, per capita. And it's extended out the end with uh, the latest uh, OECD forecast. Okay, if you, if you take a trend uh, of uh, actual GDP per capita growth from the, uh, and take, the, take 2007 as the jump-off point, you get an inflated view of, of, of the crisis losses. You get that for two reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, OECD economies were overheating in 2007. So there's some sense the level of GDP was unsustainable. And more importantly, the trend growth rate is overestimated because you have, a, as typical with a, a lot of uh, financial crises, in the run-up to financial crises, you get uh, relatively rapid growth. And the problem combining the two is that you're going to get an exaggerated counterfactual path. Compare that to the red line, which is uh, an OECD measure of potential output. Now, potential output, um, it's explained in more detail in the paper, uh, uses a production function method to try and tie down uh, a level of output which is sustainable over the medium term and is consistent with stable inflation. So one of the concepts underlying it is a, is a concept of the, of the NIRU. And if you uh, extend out... Um, if you extend out uh, p potential GDP per capita, you get a very different answer um, because the counterfactual is much less uh, optimistic. So a starting point uh, for the paper is using uh, potential output as a means of, of measuring the counterfactual. 
It's actually um, a little bit more sophisticated than just uh, extrapolating a trend. Before we do that, we, we uh, basically split potential output into a number of components. Um, if you log everything, uh, the al algebra is shown in the paper, but basically you can very easily split potential output per capita into a trend productivity component and a potential employment rate component. And then you can split the trend productivity component to TFP and capital per worker, and you can split potential employment into uh, a NIRU component, a labor force participation component, and what I'm calling here a demographic component. The demographic component uh, measures that proportion of the population which is not of working age, so it, it captures things like aging. So what's important uh, is for our, in our paper is each of those components are projected in different ways for the counterfactual. The productivity components are projected using uh, the same growth rate as a pre-crisis, uh, uh, over a pre-crisis period. And so that's the period 2000 to 2007. However, the potential employment components are all, predicted in, uh, all projected in a, in a rather different way in the counterfactual. The NIRU is kept constant at its pre-crisis level. So, for example, there are some economies that saw falling structural unemployment in the pre-crisis period rather than project that continuing over the future, which in some cases might actually mean getting close to negative uh, NIRUs. We hold it constant at, a, at the same level. The labor force participation is a, is a, is a bit tricky. We, uh, we follow what, what we, we call a, a cohort model, that allows for changes in the age structure of uh, the, the labor force. So one element of it is similar to holding uh, age-specific participation rates constant and then projecting through the age composition of, of the labor force. But actually it allows for a bit more than that because it's, it's holding entry and exit rates into the labor force constant. What that allows uh, for is that if if cohorts have a tendency to participate more in the labor force than uh, uh, cohorts of a previous generation, then to some extent that trend will be captured by the, by the projection. And the, the important point uh, as regards this projection is the, the tendency for female participation to increase. So we, we're going to capture a bit of that in, in, in uh, our counterfactual projection. And then the final component is the demographics. And as it says in the table, the essential point there is it's the same as in the current, our current projection, our latest projection of potential output. And the essential point there is when we evaluate the, the effect of the crisis, we're taking the difference between the counterfactual and our latest projection of potential output. So the demographics are the same in both, so they are not going to make any contribution to the crisis hit. So uh, what do we do? Well, what are, what are the results? Well, uh, this is a sort of summary chart looking across all OECD countries. Uh, notice first the uh, blue dashed line which is the, the median OECD country. So uh, around about now, the effect on the median OECD country is to have reduced the level of potential output by around 4%. Uh, but notice there's quite a large dispersion. I mean, there's some, the, the upper quartile of countries, there's hardly uh, much effect at all um, on potential output. And then there's a, for the lower quartile, there's a much, much bigger effect with some suspicion that this is not just a levels effect, but having, a, having some sort of effect on, on the growth rate of, uh, of potential over the medium term. And then the red line is the OECD aggregate. And the OECD aggregate, the effect, uh, something like 2.5% in 2014, is less than the median. And that's because the larger OECD countries are, in our estimates, are much less affected than the smaller countries. So in particular, Germany, Japan, um, our estimates, and we'll, we'll come on to them in a minute, are hardly affected by the crisis. Uh, so we can also decompose that shock into the components. Uh, so this slide is looking at the 
the effects on productivity, which can be broken down into capital per worker and TFP. And the important messages from this slide is a lot of the, the bulk of the, the hit to potential output is coming from productivity. Um, there's a hit from both capital and TFP. Uh, typically, the TFP hit is, is, uh, is larger, but there is a very substantial hit to a lot of economies coming from capital per worker. Um, and there's also a, a slightly uh, uh, perhaps counterintuitive result, which I'll come back to, in that the, there's a, certainly a bunch of OECD countries where capital per worker is actually growing faster than an, in our counterfactual. So this slide then looks at the same uh, effects through potential employment. The far right panel is looking at effects on structural unemployment. So there's, uh, there's some, there's some uh, economies, and we'll, we'll come on and look at some of those in, in a minute, particularly in the European periphery, where our estimates suggest there has been a, a significant increase in structural unemployment. Um, so that is impacting, and that is adding uh, to the loss in potential output. A little bit more surprising and perhaps more difficult to explain is the middle panel. Because for the OECD median, um, there's actually some slight positive effect relative to our counterfactual. Uh, so what's, what's explaining that? Well, I think one thing we, we can definitely say, whether or not you believe the counterfactual, is that labor force participation during the crisis has held up remarkably well. And that's, that's shown in a, in a lot of studies and a lot of commentary in the OECD and other places. And particularly, I think, what has been very surprising is how well um, participation of older workers has held up, particularly in comparison to severe downturns in the past. And part of the reason for that, surely, is that the sort of early retirement pathways through taking unemployment or disability benefits or even governments encouraging older workers to take those, those routes are no longer so easily available. Indeed, if you look at some of the country detail, one of the, the reasons why there might be um, this positive response is that through the crisis, some of those uh, uh, retirement, early retirement pathways have been being tightened up, and I'll, I'll try and point you out some examples. Um, but I think there's, when, we get, when we drill down to some country-specific country results, I'll give you another explanation as to why labor force participation might have been stronger than anticipated in our counterfactual. So next slide is uh, going to some country detail. There's a lot more countries in the paper, but uh, there's no way I could go through all the detail and, and, and do it justice. So I'm going to look at... Uh, two slides. First slide is, is going to pick out the big losers, the, the countries that have been hit worst uh, from the crisis on, on, on our estimate. So the, uh, so the row headings are the, are the ISO codes for, for, the, for the countries which have been worst hit. The total hit in terms of the level shift in potential output is shown in the, the final row, row three, and that's broken down in rows one and two into a productivity, trend productivity effect and a potential employment effect. So what, what, what are these countries? Uh, well, uh, tying in with Professor Barrow's um, uh, results, the, the two economies that are, are hit by far the worst, and I don't I don't think, surprisingly, uh, Iceland and Greece. But the other thing to note about all of these countries is they're all uh, small European countries, uh, mostly Euro area countries uh, and otherwise Eastern European countries. I think the other thing to note is that mostly these are countries where there's uh, adverse effects from a lot of components. So there's an adverse effect from potential employment, even though that the sort of first chart was suggesting that many, econ many OECD economies weren't having such a bad time of potential employment. And there's also, uh, these economies are also the ones that as well as suffering a TFP hit, also tend to be the ones that have hit, had the biggest hit to capital per worker. And that result I'm going to come back to. Okay, second slide is showing mostly countries which have fared relatively well. These aren't, these aren't the the top performers, but uh, there's some interesting cases. Uh, 
indeed, let, let me pause at this stage and say one of the things that I'm increasingly happy with about this paper is that you can see all the country detail. Um, you know, rather than a lot of other studies which uh, estimate panel, panel results or, or uh, show you results as, uh, as, um, uh, as confidence bands around a central result, I think a great attraction of this is that you can see the detail, and particularly because some of the counterintuitive or embarrassing results, I think, do actually have uh, some explanations. Um, so let me, let me go through uh, some of the, the countries which um, have been come out of the crisis on, on our analysis quite well. So firstly, there's some positive, some large positive labor force participation effects. How can the crisis possibly have had a, a beneficial effect on labor force participation? Well, in some cases, it hasn't. Other things are going on. In Turkey, we know there was a set of policies targeted at encouraging female and youth participation, and that was extraordinarily successful in boosting female participation. So this has nothing to do, uh, this is not a result of the, of the crisis, but it explains uh, the very large results, uh, positive effects for Turkey. For Poland, we know that there was a big tightening in disability benefit, uh, over, which, which was continued through the crisis, and that almost certainly had a, a positive effect in boosting labor force. Germany is, a, I think, a particularly interesting example. Well, there were the Hartz reforms which, had a, which were reducing structural unemployment. So we think structural unemployment, the Nairu, was falling over the crisis. So there was not uh, a, 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 an adverse effect of, of, of the crisis on structural employment, but this is the effect of, the, of the, the, the continuing effect of the reforms over the period. I think one of the results that is most interesting is the positive effect uh, on Germany's labor force participation. We've started to drill down into the results a, a bit more than is shown in the paper. And there's a European story here. If you take a scatter plot of the, what, what we've calculated as the labor force uh, participation hit to European countries, and you plot that against a variable that we call the immigration surprise, and the immigration surprise is that there's quite recently there's been released uh, data on net migration, um, which was not incorporated in our forecasts then there is an extraordinarily good fit. In other words, countries where labor force participation appears to have been boosted are also the countries like Germany where net migration has been much stronger than we expected. So in a sense, you could argue that the crisis has boosted uh, German uh, potential output through labor po force participation in the sense that uh, there has been net migration of particularly for some of the periphery countries, it's not just that people might be dropping out of the labor force as a discouraged worker effect, it's that they, there might be some net migration from the countries that have been the big losers to the countries that have, have, have been through the crisis relatively strongly, like Germany. Uh, yes, uh, I think another in interesting case is uh, th that positive capital worker effect, and that's very noticeable for Australia and Canada. Well, an obvious explanation is a lot of that must be due to mining-related activities which have taken off, and again, not particularly due to the crisis. So maybe you you'd want to ignore that in, in, uh, in uh, evaluating the crisis. Um, with so many distinguished uh, US economists around, I think it's particularly, I'd, I'd really like to highlight the, the effects on potential employment. They could be, in a sense, I think, underestimated. I mean, our central estimate has some increase in the Nairu uh, for the US. But we, are we have been experimenting with some different ways of estimating the Nairu, which work particularly well in the European periphery, and that's to use long-term, distinguish the inflationary effect of, of long-term unemployment from short-term unemployment. And as I say, that works particularly well in the European periphery. It gives you a much better statistical fit, much sharper estimates of the Nehru, and generally much higher. 
What's interesting is although the statistical fit is more marginal for the US, it gives you a much higher point estimate of the Nairu. And I know there's an there's a de ongoing debate in the US as to whether the higher levels of long-term unemployment have permanently shifted the Nairu. So that's a definite question mark. I think the other thing I'd like to point out is apparently there's not much effect of the crisis on the labor force participation rate. But be, be a little bit careful. Um, it's a, I think it's a well-known fact, labor force participation in the US has fallen a lot. We attribute um, a bit less than half of that to a cyclical effect. But more than half of it is a trend effect. And I, I think there's a, a, a big debate in the US as to how much is cyclical and how much is trend. The reason it doesn't, the reason it doesn't show up in this table is we think that trend fall can be pretty much entirely explained by demographics. So be careful, that labor force participation is not gonna come back, but it's, don't blame the crisis, but it's there in the dem demographics. Anyway, let me move on. Uh, as I say, there's a, oh, oh I, I've, put, I've put Korea on there. Not, Korea was, uh, well, better than the median, but still had a very hard hit. But uh, again, with a lot of Korean experts here, um, I'd, be, I'd really like to provoke a comment on what you think of these results. So Korea has been quite hard hit in, uh, in, against our counterfactual. Interestingly enough, that's all from a slowdown in capital per worker. Um, now, there's an interesting question, is that, does that sound believable? And if it does, would you attribute it all to the crisis or is that picking up a, a sort of longer run uh, trend? Okay, the final stage of the paper is we have these hits for different countries which have different characteristics. Can we explain them with some very simple regressions? So what we do is we take, um, take the country hits in 2014 and regress them on various pre-crisis conditions with and without a, a control variable, which is the pre-crisis output gap. So are, are, is there, are there any clues in the pre-crisis conditions which explain which countries have been hardest hit? And we look at a series of uh, variables. So first of all, a set of macro variables. Well, countries with higher inflation, large current account deficits, prolonged period of low interest rates and high investment are all countries which tended to have a, a harder hit to potential output. And I should say, this, these, these results are significant, not just in terms of statistical significance and key ratios greater than two, they're economically meaningful, they're economically significant. If you take the standard deviation of the, the dependent variable and multiply by the coefficient, you're explaining a good part of the ver country variation in the, the crisis hit. Second thing we, we look at is indebtedness. We regress the hit on total economy indebtedness, which has a, again, plays a major part in explaining cross-country dif differences. So if you have high total uh, economy indebtedness, for example, high net external debt, then you're much likely, more likely to have suffered after the crisis than, than, than otherwise. But interestingly, that's not the case for government debt. So high government debt is not correlated uh, at all with the crisis hit. Uh, final final uh, couple of results. Structural policy. Uh, the OECD has a favorite indicator, the, its product market regulation indicator, which tries to indicate how uh, favorable regulation is in terms of favoring competition in markets. And a very striking result is Countries which have more flexible uh, product markets, uh, more, more amenable to competition, also tended to suffer much lower loss, uh, potential output losses. And that also goes in terms of uh, um, stricter uh, employment protection legislation. So you could tell a story that countries which have more flexibility in product and labor markets better able to allocate resources following a shot between firms and sectors and therefore suffered more. And that, that ties in with that result. And then finally, we regressed the different components of pre-crisis trend growth on the, on the output loss. And I think, uh, I think this result is particularly significant. The only component which is correlated with the loss is, is 
the capital per worker component. In other words, countries which were uh, experiencing high growth in capital per worker were also the countries that uh, suffered the biggest potential output losses. And I, th I think if you tie that result in with the result on total economy indebtedness, the fact that low real interest rates and high investment and large current account uh, deficits were correlated with subsequent losses, I, I think you have, uh, you know, backup for the sort of changing in, change in the conventional wisdom that we can't just look at inflation anymore. We should be looking at uh, financial conditions more broadly. And uh, that's a sort of summary of my, my conclusions. Um, I, 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 won't, I won't read them out. Um, uh, but that, that's a summary of, of, of the paper. And I guess the sort of final thought to, to leave you with is if you ever see... Uh, one of these charts that um, extend uh, as a, a jumping point to a period like 2011, 2007 using a, a linear trend on growth. Um, and surprisingly, it appears in, in all sorts of places, in uh, official documents, in uh, quality financial newspapers, and even in, sometimes in OECD publications. If you see that trend, then please uh, treat it with the skepticism it deserves. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, our first discussion is uh, Simon Potter from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I'd encourage uh, all the discussions to keep closely to time. The time is being kept um, by the gentleman to your left, so you'll see him holding up One your son. One minute left? Okay. Uh, apparently, he, your time has progressed extremely rapidly, Simon. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to this very interesting conference and getting to uh, discuss a very sophisticated paper. I encourage you all to try and read it. It's a little bit more in-depth than the presentation that we saw. So the comments I'm going to give uh, have the usual disclaimer at the bottom. These are my views, nothing to do with the Federal Reserve, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, here's a quick outline. I'm just going to over, give you an overview of the paper, compare it to the uh, standard viewpoint, look at a few facts, and then give you a quick conclusion. So how does the paper work? There's a bunch of people who are incredibly risk-averse over a short period of time. And they only hold safe assets. They won't touch any other asset because it has no value to them. And this safe asset pays out to them even in the worst state of the world. And they get an ex-ante rate of return on the safe asset of RK. Then you can take risky assets, so the model's a little bit uh, ha has the capacity to transform the fruit that's coming off this tree into two types of asset, a risky asset into a safe asset. And then three things can happen. You, you, there aren't that many risk-averse people or you have a r really great technology for creating uh, uh, safe assets, then uh, you get an equilibrium where it's the risk-neutral guys that are driving everything. Alternatively, you can get a shortage of safe assets. So there, the, 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 the marginal investor is the night in the very risk-averse agent. And then you can also get events where there's just an absolute shortage of safe assets such that something else has to move. And the, the way to think about this is that the zero bound, in some sense, starts to get binding. So the technology, the only thing you can do is produce cash or something. is only a small amount of cash. So there's a shortage of safe assets. So in that equilibrium three, you need a, a recession to clear the asset markets, and that's what they call a safety trap. Let's compare that to another kind of trap, the one that we usually think of when you're at the zero bound, and that's the, the way the new Keynes have described that, is an aggregate shock comes along, uh, prices can't move quickly enough to get the re real economy to absorb that shock. Uh, what the central bank could do is make the nominal interest rate go down, and that can mitigate some of the loss of output from the shock. Why do we think that that might not be the complete description of what happened? Well, if you look at what the Fed did in 2005 and Michigan did it in 2007, they take their large model, which is the model of the U.S. It's a, it's a new Keynesian model. And they say, let's make house prices go down 25 to 30 percent. And what, what's the impact going to be if, if we follow something like the optimal policy? And I think if you go to Michigan's speech from the summer of 2007, the optimal policy had the unemployment rate was going up by about two or three tenths. So compared to the five percentage points it went up, there was a quite big difference. So we're looking for models that can amplify more than the, the 
the, the traditional type. Now, in this example of Furbish, you didn't hit the zero lower bound in some sense. What happens if you do is you need the adjustment to take place through other prices or expectations of the future. So the new, the new Keynesian story is, a, is very new or very old, and it didn't focus much on the animal spirits, which were a big part of what Keynes had. And the, the 19 agents are a little bit like an animal spirits type story that Ricardo put in his paper. So what are the policies you could follow? In the safety trap, you need to supply more risk-free, and let's put normal assets just here, keep it simple. So the, the government could issue more, more T-bills. The central bank could transfer, transform long-term government debt into reserves. Or the central bank could take in risky assets and basically turn them into safe normal assets. Two and three, and this is not a mechanism in the paper, but it's behind the paper, is if the central bank's doing things like this, it can make counterparties who might, might hold assets or you might be engaged in a relationship with more, more safe. So that's another advantage. Think about forward guidance and uh, why that's not useful in a safety trap. So here the friction is a lack of safe assets and counterparties. So it's not an aggregate demand shortage. So there's a possibility, and Ricardo hinted at the forward guidance on the balance sheet might work, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. If it was a liquidity trap you're in, then the Eggerson-Woodford formula is the following. What you need to do is convince people that future growth is going to be quite high. So that's the mu plus in Ricardo's world. That's going to boost wealth today, and it'll boost consumption today, and you'll get out of the trap. Now, this, this all looks very easy in the model they write down. It might be quite hard if people do have animal spirits or their nitrogen agents, because they might not be the first person who goes ahead and think the world is a better place. The other choice is to use a large-scale asset pr assets purchase. Here you're trying to lower the term premium, long-term debt, or re reduce prepayment premium, which you see in the US mortgage market. So that's just the outline again. Here I'm just going to show you how big uh, the change in safe, safe, in quotes, assets was. This shows uh, the securitization industry uh, uh, in, in the US. And you can see a big increase in the amount of uh, issuance as you go through 2005 to early 2007. Then this massive crash in the issuance. Now, this produced massive amounts of triple A assets. It turned out that some of these weren't really triple A assets. That was a bit of a shock to people. So it had, it effectively increased the number of Nigerian agents who were left, uh, who, who were in, 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 in the global economy. And it was a big demand shock as well, because behind this production of safe assets was also how we were giving out credit in the US economy. Uh, here's another metric for it. This shows you asset-backed commercial paper. That's the blue line. And you can see that fell at, at a tremendous rate. The red line shows you how much was done in overnight repo. That's a different scale. But these are moving in hundreds of billions at a pretty quick rate. Uh, here's a way of trying to capture what the model has. So this is the pricing of a AAA uh, subprime tranche of a mortgage, uh, of, a, of mortgage backed securities. And the mechanism in this model is as you get close to this bad event, risk af uh, risky assets have to drop massively in price so they can have this massive rate of return. And you saw it exactly in, 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 this, tran in this type of pricing. Alternatively, here, here's a really strange one. Uh, the Treasury bill to the OIS spread, that widened, widened out a lot. So uh, a, a swap, is a pre it still has some counterparty risk in it, but because the way the money is transferred doesn't expose you to that much counter counterparty risk, this is showing you really a great desire for a particular type of asset, which is UST bill, just because you don't trust anything else. And one thing to note is that this premium disappears pretty quickly. So it's clear, and I think R Ricardo made this clear in the way he described it, that this was a big part of the crisis, the collapse of the securitization of AAA tranches, the repricing of those tranches, all, all consistent with it, and then that massive flight to quality, whether it be assets or types of counterparties. So there's two shocks. The fraction of 19 agents increased. That's the animal spirits type shock. And the other one is 
boy, it's a much more complicated world than I thought it was. And that those both been examined by quite a lot of people. So what I'm going to do is be a bit unfair to the paper. So the paper is a very stylized but very tightly constructed model. Let's just run it through what, the, what implies about the data. So it's a little bit unfair because you, it's just supposed to make you think, but sometimes it's helpful to take those thoughts and see if it matches some of the data we're seeing. So what, what did the Fed do? You could argue what the Fed did is it just asked, it manufactured a lot of safe assets. And as you can see here, the Fed can ask, uh, manufacture safe assets really, really quickly. So here's four examples. The, in the, with the repo market, there was issues about whether that, that market could be sustained with the usual set of investors. So the Fed substituted its funding of dealers for what the private sector was doing. Uh, the term securities lending facility switched mortgage-backed securities, and this would include both private and public agency mortgage-backed securities against treasury collateral, so pure production and safe assets. The commercial paper funding facility provided funding of high-quality CP, and the TALF, that provided funding of securitized assets with a put. So if you start to get worried about the value of that assets, just give it back to the Fed. So all those things were an attempt to produce safe assets. You can see that that was, relative to the chart I showed you before, this is pretty quick production of safe assets. Another type of safe asset that's come up uh, in, in a couple of the presentations are the large-scale asset purchase programs. So over here you can see in green on the asset side, the big increase in the, the lending that the Fed did, the, the vertical line there is pretty informative. That's around uh, when, when, when Lehman Brothers failed. And then you can see the, the amount of treasuries on the Fed balance sheet and the mortgage-backed securities increased. So these mortgage-backed securities are agency mortgage-backed securities. As far as the Fed's concerned, they don't contain credit risk. However, the market thought that they did contain credit risk. So the fact the Fed was buying them made them appear safer to the market, even though in most states of the world they were safe, safe although if you were a, a NYCHIN-type agent, you would not think they're safe compared to a U.S. Treasury because the Treasury would never be clear whether they had the full faith and credit. And on the other side of this, you can see what, what we substituted. As, as we were buying these assets from the private sector, we gave them central bank reserves, which is a very safe asset. And here, what you can think of us of, of having done is taking out interest rate risk that people were holding. It doesn't quite fit with the R Ricardo story because the interest rate risk is the wrong way if you're in a bad state of the world for these assets. And prepayment and the credit risk. The prepayment risk is in the U.S. mortgage market. And there you are, that's consistent with, with Ricardo's story because what you're worried about is that things get worse and there'll be faster prepayment flows in. And it also obviously had the direct rate effect, which is the usual way that people describe the LSAT. Here's an example going across some other central banks of how much of the, the, the safe assets they, they have manufactured recently. This shows securities portfolio as a percent of GDP. You can see the, the Bank of Japan in particular is manufacturing, if you like, a lot of safe assets recently. See, the ECB did less of this. It did it in a different way. The ECB, basically, they went in and they bought a small amount of sovereign debt, but that was to get market functioning. The Bank of England and the Fed bought quite a large amount relative to GDP. The, the, the second panel shows you the appropriate measure, which is how much of you doing this in, in addition to the currency out there. And you can see the ECB didn't do too much of it. The, the Fed, Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England are doing a lot of that. Okay, another way of looking at what the Fed did is to look at the duration of the Treasury portfolio. So that's the red line. So it went from a duration which is pretty uh, close to the uh, outstanding, du outstanding duration of, uh, of U.S. Treasuries to one where it got close to eight years. Or al alternatively, the blue line is the number of 10-year equivalents in the portfolio. That's about $3 trillion right now. Another thing that uh, is different from the safety trap, remember it does not going to work, is forward guidance. This shows you, I think, two things. People thought the, the, the recovery would happen much quicker than it actually did at the start. And then the effect of both the calendar and threshold guidance was to flatten these lines. So all of those things, if it's the more classic liquidity trap, should help you get out of it. So let's look at some data now. 
under the story that Ricardo told, you shouldn't see this, this happen. So in his story, we went to the really bad state of the world. So wealth should not recover in that state of the world because we're just poorer. The trees in his model aren't producing as much fruit. In this one, you see that nominal wealth definitely did come back and has been increasing quite strongly recently. If you look at out, the output gap measures, so you could measure them in 50 different ways, as, as we've just seen. Here's what the CBO thinks. There's still a substantial output gap in, in the US. Possibly that's because the, the lingering effects of a safety or liquidity trap are there, or it could be because something else is going on. But if we think of the safety, safety trap, it's hard to believe it's still as active. It looked like it really closed down in the US in early 2009. So that's just a summary there of the, what we think of the safety versus the liquidity trap. So the summary is that recent years suggest it's the liquidity trap mechanism. What's the implications for monetary policy and financial stability? Well, just go, let's read from the bottom. If you buy, if you buy the safety trap, then that, that actually makes things wor worse if you believe in the standard uh, Keynesian type channels. So there, therefore, what choice do you have? You have the level of rates. Well, that goes away when there's zero bound. And you have the size of uh, composition of the balance sheet. More importantly, you might have guidance about the use of tools in certain states of the world. One of the things that's not discussed here is what the, uh, Mario Draghi did in J July 2012. He said, don't, don't believe that these particular set of assets are not safe. And I guarantee you, if you start to think they're not safe, I will come in and swap them for something that you are sure is, is safe. That seemed very powerful. So maybe what central banks need to do in this world is just say they stand prepared to supply the safe asset rather than actually supply it. And then uh, I think R Ricardo did a great job at the start. I wasn't sure from reading the paper about what exactly is a safe asset. So we're, if we're in some countries in the world and we said the central bank is producing a safe asset, they would laugh completely at you. Zimbabwe, uh, Argentina, right? They wouldn't believe the central bank is producing safe assets. So if you think about one of the things that is surprising is central banks managed to increase the size of their balance sheet in many of these countries, but they didn't move long forward inflation expectations up. And the only way that they can produce safe assets is if they don't produce move the long forward inflation expectations up. It'd be interesting to understand why they're able to do that relative to what people thought of the standard formula. And then the other thing that I think we've seen discussed two or three times is if you want to see the quickest increase in safe asset production in 2008, it's from the swaps. And that, that's something to do with what's special about the US dollar. And I don't think it's just because it's a funding currency. There's something spe it has a special safeness to it over some of the other currencies that are out there. And then I just, f I just finish with the, this sort of reminder that you could, uh, if, if you believe in this world where beliefs, uh, people are very worried about certain events, they could quite easily believe that the government is not the most credible uh, agent to produce safe assets for you because they might not trust what the government might do in a later state of the world. Thank you, Simon. Our uh, next discussant is uh, Jonathan Ostry from the International Monetary Fund. Great. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this conference. Uh, views of my own, not the IMFs. Um, so my uh, presentation is going to be in two parts. I'm going to spend a few minutes on uh, David's paper, and then I'm going to turn to something else. Uh, there's another discussant also of David's paper, so uh, you'll have plenty of discussion of that paper. So um, if I were a, a journalist uh, uh, writing about this paper, I, I'd um, posit two headlines. Uh, the first would be that... Um, Properly measured, uh, the crisis uh, had a lower cost than you thought. And second, uh, nothing that you do during the crisis will have any material impact on the cost that you will bear. 
Okay, so with that, that provocation, uh, let me, let me uh, go quickly uh, through um, some initial slides. Um, I, I'm not going to go through um, the, the guts of the paper. David did an excellent job uh, of that. But let me just say up front, um, do I really care about potential output costs uh, as, a, as a metric here? I think I, I care about them, but I also care about medium medium term uh, output costs for welfare. Um, and you know indeed, you know output may be below potential for many, many years uh, for, for a number of good reasons, uh, including the the strong breaks that are uh, that are being uh, put in place uh, from high debts. So um, again, I think we need estimates of where we are vis-a-vis -vis potential. Um, uh, and, you know, the course of actual output as well as potential output um, uh, in terms of calibrating macro policies and assessing uh, external sustainability. So we, we need to look at both things. Um, David's exercise, which he's gone through, is extremely careful. Um, I'm not going to go through, uh, you know, the details of how he constructs the counterfactual uh, and how he extends his own forecasts. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the many virtues of this approach. I think what he spent a lot of time on is sort of uh, going through the, the disaggregated detail in terms of the constituent components. I think that is indeed uh, a, one of the many virtues of this approach. And again, what, what he delivers uh, is in this picture. I've sort of combined two pictures that he put up uh, on his slides, and you can see uh, very easily that gaps between solid blue and, um, and dotted blue lines, which is uh, sort of the counterfactual um, uh, that you get from extending pre-crisis trends in actual output, yields a much larger cost than you do when you compare the red line and the dotted gray line, which is uh, what he went through with you today. So I, I want to ask the question, you know, is 4% uh, a reasonable number? Um, uh, and it, it may well be a reasonable number, but I think we should bear in mind that, you know, historical banking crises uh, ha have been found to have much larger costs, and he cites them, and he, and he feels these are plagued by methodological um, uh, problems. But I think um, another thing he did not mention is that the current round of banking crises seem to have been uh, even more costly than your run-of-the-mill historical banking crisis. Um, and, and, and a number uh, of features of the panel on the right are, are noteworthy. Uh, first up, again, the, the size, the median size of the cost is larger. It seems to be more persistent. Output is still, still falling. Many many years after the inception of the crisis. Um, and, you know, the bottom of the distribution is, is really huge, and the top of the distribution doesn't include, as we have in the historical banking crisis uh, cases, cases um, any people who seem to be benefiting uh, several years on out. Now, one thing I should mention is that um, uh, David is looking at the OECD, and a number of OECD countries didn't have banking crises. So this, this may be one reason why his, um, his number is smaller than you might get by just focusing on the subset of countries that actually did uh, get into a soup during this period. Um, another key thing that I think you want to focus on is, you know, what is your view uh, about the uh, output gap uh, at the beginning of the crisis? And, and David, uh, David criticized a lot of previous papers for sort of extrapolating uh, uh, pre-crisis trends. Um, and, and I should mention, in fairness to the, to the authors who, who he does criticize, I think a number of them have, um, have rebutted some of these claims. But, but let me just say that both the IMF and the OECD have uh, sharply revised um, their view of where, where economies were vis-a-vis -vis potential um, uh, at the, uh, just, just before the crisis. But the OECD has, has undertaken a much sharper uh, revision. And, and you want to think about whether, whether the size of the pre-crisis the pre output gap 
uh, in light of other indicators, such as what was going on uh, with inflation, i.e. not very much, um, whether that, that uh, number is plausible. Because once you accept that number, then I think much of what David uh, says follows. If you don't accept that number, uh, and I myself am agnostic on this, uh, then I think you, you would have uh, questions. Another thing is sort of a more classic endpoint issue. I mean, hindsight now allows you to sort of um, have a view of uh, trend labor productivity um, in, in 2007, say, um, that reflects sort of the very weak output performance uh, uh, as the crisis unfolded, and again, whether this gives rise to an endpoint problem. Um, country by country, again, you know, um, some surprises. David, David uh, addressed a number of them in his comments. I'm not going get, to uh, get into the weeds here, but Czech Republic in the bucket of the worst. Did, did Czech even have a banking crisis? Um, uh, a number of countries really um, uh, do better from the crisis. Uh, again, um, there's a lot going on here. It's not just the crisis. But, uh, again, s some questions. And, you know, the challenges of e estimating the Nehru when inflation is around zero. Again, these are well known, but, but they do plague uh, uh, and underscore some of the challenges uh, in this area. Uh, and then finally, my last slide on, on David's paper, you know, is it really true that the costs of the crisis um, are, are, not, are, are not influenced to any extent uh, by, by what you do during the crisis? And, and here's a chart um, uh, that suggests that maybe fiscal uh, it, it, it is, um, is, an, is a lever that does allow you to uh, mitigate some of those uh, medium-run medium run costs. Uh, whether they're in terms of potential. I mean, uh, my sense is that uh, after several years, um, uh, there's a kind of blurred distinction between uh, potential and actual. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now uh, because I think one of the reasons David's paper is so important and one of the reasons he looks at this issue in such detail is that there's a second legacy of the crisis, um, uh, namely the, the legacy of very high public debt that the first legacy, low potential output, um, uh, you know, these two things are related. In other words, um, you know, if you have very, you, the extent to which you, you are worried about very high uh, public debt in the aftermath of the crisis may depend on, on how you see the, the, the likely future for potential and actual output. Um, and so, you know, um, one of the things that, that, that I've been struck by um, is that really uh, all the debate uh, these days um, is not so much about whether public debt is too high, but really only about um, how fast it should be brought down when we are on a more even keel and to what level it should be bought, brought down. But it seems sort of axiomatic that it must be brought down. And I want to ask, is there any basis in theory uh, for, for, for taking such a, such a stance. Um, uh, and, and there's also a relationship to, to another part of the current debate, which is about the big push and how, uh, uh, how that relates to the legacy of high public debt. And so my sense was that theory uh, should provide a guide, but the, the, the theory on the normative level of public debt, it really turns out to provide remarkably little guide um, sort of naive, repeated game um, view of the classic paper in this area, which is Lucas and Stokey, suggests that uh, public debt um, uh, will be run up uh, forever. But you have uh, other papers, including by, by Tom Sargent and others, that suggests that a normatively de desirable level of public debt is a positive asset position. Uh, and you have papers uh, in the middle, like de Bortoli and Nunes. So I'm going to consider the simplest possible model in which public debt serves only one function, which is smoothing distortions wrought by, dis by, by taxation over time. And I'm not going to go through the gory details. It's a very standard uh, model. Uh, there's uh, public and private capital. There's um, uh, labor. There's, uh, there's uh, a government consumption good and a private good. And uh, you can write out the optimality conditions. You can then solve the Ramsey problem of a benevolent government. Um, and and here is the punchline uh, uh, of this model, which is that although um, although the taxes are distortive, and so there will be gaps between uh, private and social marginal rates of substitution and marginal utilities, the intertemporal distortion the, the intertemporal decisions are not distorted. And so, basically, the government is going to use the market interest rate in deciding on its debt and taxation decisions. 
And so this turns out to have a very powerful implication for the issue at hand, which is, should governments pay down the debt? And basically what it turns out is that, no, the answer from this kind of model is that governments should live with the debt. It's always more costly um, to uh, distort the intertemporal decision in order to bring down the debt uh, than it is to simply live with the debt. And, th and that's kind of, in a way, counterintuitive because on, on one hand you think, okay, I'm buying myself the, the opportunity of having lower distortions forever, so sh surely I should you know, pay up once and for all uh, in order to allow myself to reap those benefits. But that intuition turns out to be wrong. For, for the reason that I, uh, that I said a couple slides ago in terms of the intertemporal decision not being distorted. So here is a snapshot of what a model like this says. It says if you inherit high levels of public debt, you should live with them. Yes, there is a cost. You are poorer by virtue of the distortive taxes needed to service that debt forever. And yes, the optimal public capital stock is going to be lower by that token. So that does speak to issues of big push. But really, this is the first best that you can do. Put, I'm not going to get through the empirical side. I'm out of time. But yes, costs of inherited public debt are high. But the costs of repayment are higher and convex, rising at an increasing rate uh, in, the, in the speed with which you decide to pay back the, des the debt. And likely, in my, sen in, in, in my way of thinking, likely to be smaller than the benefits you get from uh, reduced crisis risk as a result of uh, getting below uh, possible debt limits. So last slide. Um, I think David's paper is a very useful contribution. I think it is a complement to the other literature um, on uh, estimating the costs of crises um, uh, rather than a substitute for it. I think uh, the issues uh, of why we are concerned with um, the, the hit to productivity from the crisis also bear uh, a relationship to other uh, elements of the post-crisis legacy, including uh, high public debt. And I think the messages of a very simple standard model is that you should live with high public debt, even though it makes you poorer. Um, paying, paying it back is actually a cure that is worse uh, than the disease. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Our, our last discussion is uh, Enrique Alvarola. Let me first thank the Bank of Korea for inviting me to discuss the, the good paper of, of David. Um, I'm going to, to make a, a discussion on this paper. Basically, I agree with all the, with the, with the approach and uh, the idea that uh, you have to control for I mean, it's good to get into the potential output to look for the cost of, on the, of the crisis. Um, and actually, underlying this, this view is the fact that, uh, as you mentioned that in the paper, that the, the, the estimates of output cap and potential growth before the crisis were very much dri driven by micro, microeconomic imbalances. Uh, and this, you have a part in the paper focusing on that, uh, which is the last part you have mentioned, which larger imbalances are related with higher potential output costs. But for me, and in my view, I mean, one corollary policy or practitioner corollary of this, of this paper is that we should uh, take into account macroeconomic imbalances when uh, estimating potential growth. We do that, but we just have one imbalance, which is inflation. Uh, there is a recent literature um, uh, a growing literature on this issue, and this paper by Borio, Juscelius, and Dijayagu, by the way, is here, uh, which looks at how the financial cycle may have impinged on the estimation of the potential growth, and we have an alternative uh, proposal, uh, but let me, let me first elaborate a bit on this. In this graph, what we have is the is the comparison of the real-time potential growth, which is the, gro the potential growth which was computed by the OECD at the year of each estimation, compared with the ex-post potential growth, which are the last data of the OECD, up to 2012. And what you see is that there has been a downward revision of potential growth, which has to do with the known, what we know 
after the crisis for the cases of the U.S. and more interestingly for the case of Spain, where potential growth was going up and exposed potential growth has been going down. Uh, and this is interesting because when we put together the exact estimates of potential growth, most in the case of Spain, with some macroeconomic imbalances, you can see a positive relationship, which means that potential growth was going up while imbalances, in this case, current to term balance was widened. This was corrected in the Spox estimation, but this leads us to the idea that uh, the, the potential, a real time potential estimates of growth may be contaminated by these macroeconomic imbalances. And we have to try to deal with it. Other way to put it is in this slide, for a sample of countries, what we have is the, the, the correlation between real-time potential output and the changes in these macroeconomic imbalances. So you see that there is a negative correlation between current account and these estimates as we saw in the case of Spain. But also, there is a negative, a positive correlation between the exposed output gap and the real-time potential growth. This means that there is something going on in the estimations of potential growth in real time. So what we have tried to do in a recent paper at the bank uh, is to try to compute what we call sustainable growth rate, which is basically the growth that could, could be consistent with the stable imbalances or the growth which would not widen or generate macroeconomic imbalances. And to do so, we take a very loose view of what is an imbalance, and we basically use all these uh, usual suspects of, of variables which could get into imbalance, which can be prices, flows, and stock, and of course you have here the CPA inflation. And with this, we go we try to derive the sustainable growth in an analogous way uh, to how potential growth is estimated. So a production function in which instead of using just inflation, we use a battery of external domestic imbalances, and then we take the same methodology to get the trend uh, in all factors, not, so, not only employment, using these imbalances and weighting the, the overall trend by the quality of fit of all these imbalances. This is pretty you know, a very schematic view, but you have in the paper the details. And then when we do that, of course, what we get in the results is that the sustainable output growth we derive is uncorrelated with these imbalances. Each country has different imbalances, some are significant, others not, but basically we do this for, for a, a sample of countries, which includes the US and Spain, which is the ones I will, I, will, I will show here. So how do the numbers look like, or the line look like? What we see is that this sustainable growth basically comes out to be lower, both in the case of, a, in the case of US than what is, was estimated for the US and what is currently estimated. The reason is that some of these imbalances, and this is the interpretation, have not been, uh, have not been corrected so that the output gap is different too, and actually the actual output gap we get is lower than the one estimated even now by the OECD. For the case of Spain, what we get is a more a smooth line of sustainable growth, different profile than the real-time potential growth, but also different in terms of smoothness than the exposed potential growth. What's interesting is that with this methodology, the output gaps are much wider than what was estimated in 2007, of course, and even what is uh, estimated now by the, by the OECD. Uh, but note, I mentioned at the beginning, that we should incorporate this in real-time estimation of potential growth. And these are basically also, these sustainable growth are exposed estimation. So uh, we also do in the exercise is to take the data up to 2007 and then there estimate what we would have got with this procedure. And what you get for Spain is a quite time consuming exercise. Is this what you have in the violet line? We have this profile of the potential growth, which is lower 
than the real-time potential growth for the years just before the crisis. And this is done from 1980. That's why the output gap look more different. And what we see in the output gap, and this is the interesting thing, is that the output gap we will have estimated in 2007 is very similar to the output gap we are estimating exposed. And this is very large, too. So if we have, we have applied this methodology in 2007, we would have seen, which is something none of us saw, nor the OECD, nor the Bank of Spain, nor the European Commission, that the output gap for Spain was really, really large at that time. Uh, so basically, uh, in this discussion, I made this mention to the methodology. Uh, we know that the, the potential growth estimate is a key element to, for policy making. And I mean, even with this uh, improvement you are doing, uh, I mean, it's still failing to consider these uh, imbalances that accumulate. And so this is basically a proposal to consider macro imbalances. And we, we have decided to, we, we try to do that in, to embed this in, a, in the traditional methodology uh, because we thought this would be uh, useful uh, uh, as a way to, to for practitioners to, to adapt uh, this sort of estimation. This is just a proposal, of course. This is a still a black box. I mean, the computation of this is, is pretty difficult, and we have to improve on the multidimensional estimation. Just notice that we have a lot of imbalances, and we try to get just a number out of this, and we are working currently at this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Um, I think uh, given time, what we'll do now is uh, uh, open the floor up for uh, 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, at the end of that time, I'll, I'll return the floor to the authors and they'll, uh, uh, we'll gather some questions and we'll turn the floor back over to the authors to allow them to the opportunity to answer uh, those questions they want to answer and, uh, and also uh, respond to the, to the excellent comments made with the discussions. Uh, I'll take the prerogative of the chair and, and open things up by uh, maybe offering a, uh, a comment on each of the, uh, the papers. Um, in, on, the, on Ricardo's paper, uh, and I think it's important work and, 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 and really interesting, I think the challenge in real time for policymakers is to know about uh, the, what's going to be safe and how their actions are going to be uh, influencing the, in the, uh, uh, the beliefs about private agents about what is safe. So if you start to supply a large amount of uh, safe assets to make up for uh, perceived shortfalls in that, uh, how far can you go before um, um, private markets uh, begin to suspect that what you're supplying is, is, uh, is actually not going to be safe? The, uh, my comment on, on uh, David's paper is about the dangers, of my perceptions of the dangers of the use of the term potential output. Um, I think that that term potential output can, can easily lead policymakers to, to think that there's nothing they can do to influence uh, that path. That line called potential is beyond the, 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 uh, the effects, the, the, re the reach of policy. Uh, but in fact, David's own estimates show that that's not true. Um, if, uh, the, it really points to different kinds of policies being used instead. Um, for example, in Turkey, we, we see that over the um, uh, the, the impact of the crisis, quote unquote, uh, due to policy changes in, impacted in Turkey, is that there was an uh, increase of seven and a half percent in in potential output. I think it's very important for us to be thinking about as we go forward not to be taking these uh, dotted lines of various kinds as being beyond the the reach of what we we could hope to to influence through through policy. Okay, so those are my two comments, and I'm happy now to turn it uh, over to the floor as a whole. There is, uh, uh, Bob Gordon has a uh, question. Uh, there's considerable overlap between David's uh, paper and uh, what you'll see from me later. I just am talking about the United States, but I wanted to emphasize his caution about the treatment of labor force participation. Uh, how much of it you consider to be cyclical? How much of you consider it to be a uh, sort of a mechanical effect of the retirement of the baby boom generation. The particular timing of that is different in the U.S. than it is in most other places. And how much remains for this insidious long-run decline in the labor force participation of prime-age adult men and uh, youth? Uh, 
there's been something like a 20-point decline in the prime age, in the uh, youth participation rate, and only a third of that can be explained by higher levels of schooling. Uh, so we're facing a fact, which is rapidly declining labor force participation, and we have a number of different ways of interpreting it and a, a real subtle problem of how to uh, distinguish those causes. Yeah, uh, Robert Barrow has a comment. So I really like the general uh, spirit of the model, as I understood it, uh, that Ricardo uh, put forth. I haven't really had an opportunity to fully digest it, but I was a little puzzled by some of the specific modeling choices. And I was wondering, why did you adopt this framework where you had this, uh, this group of extreme uh, Knightian people with uh, kind of infinite risk aversion? I, I, I didn't understand why that was necessary. I could see why you need not a single representative agent, but uh, at least two types where one has more risk aversion than the other one. And um, so I didn't understand why you didn't pursue what at, at the moment seems to me a, a simpler framework, but I think it would get the spirit of the uh, results that you, uh, you went through. This is one of the many deficiencies of being short that I can't see uh, questions. But um, I think at this point, maybe I'll turn the, the floor back to the authors and allow them a chance to, to respond to the comments and questions we've heard so far. R Ricardo, why don't you take the lead on that? How much do we have? Uh, very little. <laughs> <laughs> so let me estimate it and then have it again. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, so um, on, on Simon, uh, I got a little worried when he said that, uh, that he was going to be unfair. I thought he was tremendously fair. He did what anyone that writes a mold wants somebody that to do is to just you know interpret the right concepts, uh, focus on the things that are important, and then map them into data. So I thought you were extremely fair. You also, what I also did is you highlight the, the, the superb job that the Fed did during this crisis, and I share that view as well. So, so indeed, the gap could have been much larger, but there were lots of the right type of policies undertaken, and, and that uh, helped the U.S. economy enormously not to fall into one of these new minus type events. So that's the only uh, discrepancy I have with your comment. I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, the only part where I disagree a little bit with, with sort of what the Fed has done is in the last stage is what we call Operation Twist. And, and, and the reason I disagree with that is that if you take literally the model, and then I'm going to add a caveat to that, uh, uh, actually long-term debt is an incredibly useful asset. If it's safe and long-term debt, because then you have potential capital gains, which is even better than having something that doesn't lose value if something terrible happens, you have something that that gains value if something bad happens. Now, uh, um, so, so in that sense, in this model, if you take away long-term debt from the private sector and give them short-term debt, you reduce the effective supply of safe assets they have because they lose a hedge for the natural portfolios. By the way, that's the same thing that happened with the Swiss franc. When the Swiss franc put up a, a floor on their effects, that messed up lots of effects portfolios. I mean, people couldn't go long to with half or... Uh, the Polish Slotty and all these current currencies because you didn't have a natural hedge. So, so in this model, if you take away the long-term debt, that's a bad thing. Having said that, uh, uh, um, uh, it is also true that it's the actions of the Fed that made it appear such a great hedge because you knew that there was a support for this asset if things went wrong. So, so, so there's a little tension there, but it's not an ambiguous that, that the OT-type policies sort of help. While it is an ambiguous in a model like this that the QE1 type policies, the ones you describe, uh, uh, do, do help. The only discrepancy here with your comment is that we don't focus on the, on, the, on the situation where the crisis has happened. We focus, and this relates a little bit to what Robert said, uh, 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 we focus on the situation where people fear that this terrible thing can happen. And as the fear subsides, wealth does increase in this, in this model. So, so it's consistent with your pattern. As, as, as the share of Nikens of very scared people sort of goes away, uh, then, then wealth naturally rises as an equilibrium. Uh, and and, and uh, so I can jump to what Robert said. Why do we have these very extreme agents when we could have done something simpler? Well, 
from a modeling point of view, actually, I think this is a lot simpler than having two people with uh, different degrees of risk aversion. It's very stark. <laughs> I like the stark models, and I understand that we, so, so, so it is very simple. But there is another more substantive issue, which doesn't really play a role in my explanation and comes from previous work I've done because it's very much I believe. I do believe that there is something very true thing in episodes like this on, on, on fear, on the change in fear itself, on night and events, things that, that make no sense if you do the right accounting, but that are up to more than the actual event. Armin Krishnamurti and I wrote a paper, for example, where the role for policy was exactly because of that. The, 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 social, the social planner, the, the Fed in this case, didn't know more than the private agents about the risks in the economy, but it knew one thing, that the, some of the things they were thinking about could not happen, and that creates space for policy. Now, we don't use that ingredient here, so you're absolutely right, and from the point of view of explaining the mechanics, we could have done it with two different degrees of risk aversion, and we have gotten much of what, 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 what you described. Uh, uh, but, but I think the model is simpler this way, at least if you're used to think about regions rather than first order conditions. <laughs> And, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I do believe that substantively sort of enormous fears of the financial system play a very central role during crisis. Uh, I guess I stop here or I have something else? I, because I have something else to say. Uh, say something okay. briefly. But. <laughs> no, the last point that, that, that Simon made is on, on the type of policies that may work and he described sort of the, the superb intervention that Mario Draghi had known and, and, and indeed I think your interpretation is exactly right. And I think that actually the U.S. did something very similar, which I now I worry very much that Europe is not about to do, which is when, when the U.S. ran its stress test, it right side to it put, put a commitment on capital. So look, you you find your capital, and if you don't, we are here. And that immediately guaranteed that the banks would survive. Maybe the current owners would not or whatever, but the banks would survive. That, that was crucial. Now Europe is going through a stress test, and I don't see that, that much in capital there. So, so at the end, I don't see how you're not going to end up lying about this stuff, because if you don't have the capital, then it's a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, let me turn uh, things over to David now. Uh, yeah, thank you very much to the discussants. I think some uh, very interesting comments, and I think also uh, some of your comments are actually very complimentary. Um, so Jonathan uh, uh, had this question, do we, should we only care about potential output? And of course we should care about um, actual output. I, I think that's mentioned in a footnote in the paper, but just to emphasize that, even some of the economies where the potential output loss uh, doesn't amount to very much, if you accumulate the, the negative output gap until they get back to potential, at least in our projections, then that cumulative, if you like, cyclical output loss is very much bigger in most cases than any downturn that, 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 that most OECD of countries have experienced in the post-war period. And in some cases, that cumulative output loss is two or even three times the worst downturn they've experienced in the post-war period. So, you know, absolutely there are, there are other measures of the, the financial crisis. Uh, I think there was uh, both discussants um, an issue which I, I think is tremendously interesting and, and exciting for and right for further work is uh, trying to tie down measures of the, uh, the real-time output gap. And uh, Jonathan raised this question, well, should, is inflation good enough? And, uh, and I think uh, Enrique was answering that with suggesting that there are other, uh, other measures. Um, well, let, let me say, actually, by saying something I should have said right at the start, this, these are, um, are my views and not the OECD views. Um, I think, sure, I, I, I think inflation wasn't signaling a problem, but I think there were plenty of imbalance indicators that were indicating. So I, I think if you're trying to measure the, uh, the output gap in real time, uh, using uh, some of these indicators, uh, and uh, Enrique mentioned his own work and uh, the work of Claudio Borges and others at uh, the BIS, I think using things like credit growth, house prices, I think can all be informative and very impressive in, uh, in tying down the real-time estimates of the output gaps so that they don't uh, get subject to, to huge, huge revisions. Uh, but just one word of, well, a couple of words of caution on that. One, it's very difficult to have a recipe book. What I want is a recipe book that I can apply to all OECD countries. And we've experimented with Enrique's method and with Claudio's method. 
and it works beautifully for some countries like US, Spain, UK, Ireland, but it, it doesn't work. It doesn't give you completely counterintuitive results for a lot of other economies. So I, I think that's work, uh, sort of work in progress. And then related to my, to, to my paper, well, uh, now, uh, I think at the time it might have given bad real-time estimates. I don't think it undermines now um, a, a, a view uh, a, a, the decomposition that's in the paper. Um, so I think it, it, using inflation as an anchor is uh, subject to problems, especially when you have huge shocks, but I hope it's less of a problem uh, for the decomposition in the paper. Uh, Jonathan sort of mentioned some funny results, um, um, Chile, Australia, Germany, Turkey. Well, as I say, I actually like that feature of my paper, that, that you can pick out the results and, and talk about them. And actually, I think there are stories for Chile, Australia, Germany, Turkey, why, relative to the counterfactual, uh, out, potential output has been higher. And I, I like that feature of the paper. Uh, it, it does raise a question in my mind how, uh, how the paper is, is restructured. Uh, is that me? <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, written in the future. And then, then finally, the, 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 the chair's point about um, uh, the dangers of potential output, that it's not a, give, a given thing, but, uh, but governments can have an influence. Well, actually, that's one of... Uh, one of what we think is one of the strengths of the OECD is we, we have uh, a lot of the work is actually targeted at precisely that. Um, we have a, what we call a flagship publication, Going for Growth, which highlights uh, structural priorities for each OECD country and tries to quantify uh, the, the sorts of reforms that governments can take to boost potential output. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for uh, your participation in this session, which I think was excellent. Thank you.